Today is April 5, 2016. My name is Daria Latovska and we are in the Senior Physiologist Lounge of the San Diego Convention Center during the annual meeting of the American Physiological Society. Today it is my honor and my pleasure to interview Dr. Paul Quinton for the Society's Living History Project. Dr. Quinton has been an APS member since 1978 and he has been affiliated with the University of California, San Diego since 1998. Dr. Quinton's research interests are a result of a personal discovery, and they have been focused on the efforts to understand cystic fibrosis. Dr. Quinton, welcome to the Society's Living History Program, and thank you for agreeing, for agreeing to be interviewed for this project. And um, if you're ready, I would like to ask you a couple of questions about your career. Sure. Thank you very much for inviting me, and it's certainly an honor to have you interview me. And I hope you knew what you were doing when you did this, <laughs> when you agreed. <laughs> well, very well. If you are ready, uh, let's start from the very beginning. Um, can you <coughs> tell us uh, about your family, your upbringing, and your early interests? Well, uh, I sort of grew up in the, in the woods uh, with a bunch of animals. So I guess that was my early training to be kind of a physiology biologist. And we had horses and chickens and calves and rabbits and things like that. And uh, we lived on the edge of a, a, a kind of a, a woods reserve. And so where was that, if you don't know that was in southeast Texas, where they have mosquitoes that have shadows that weigh two pounds. And uh, so, uh, but it was a great childhood. And uh, I uh, grew up uh, with uh, lung problems. Uh, we never really knew what the problems were until much later when uh, I was uh, in uh, an undergraduate and discovered that the problem was due to cystic fibrosis. And so that had the impact of sort of setting my career once I decided that uh, I wasn't going to medical school and uh, decided and was instructed by a physician to go to to uh, get a, to become a scientist, as he said. Right. <coughs> so, but going a little bit back again, um, would you mind telling us a little bit about your early interests, maybe your school projects, oh, yes. or anything that inspired your interest for science? Okay. okay, I see what you're getting at now. You're you're getting to this crosswords crossroads in life. You know, these things where you come to a point and something happens and sends you off in one direction or the other. Well, for me, I, my mother brought me up saying, you're going to be uh, a jack of all trades and master of none. And I was, I was really interested in all sorts of things. I had a curiosity about lots of things. And when I was in high school, I uh, was on the debate team and in the, in the speech club and also in the chemistry uh, club and the science club. And <clears throat> so as a consequence of that, my chemistry professor gave me a, a little box of a little bottle of some powder <coughs> that had just been developed by DuPont and it turned out that it was an ion exchange resin and he gave it to me and says well why don't you do a science fair project of this and so I said okay <coughs> and um, about the same time my English teacher said that uh, well there is a playwright contest <coughs> at uh, <coughs> pardon me at uh, Trinity University in San Antonio for high school uh, students. So why don't you write a play? So I did both and lo and behold, I won the prize for the, the science fair. And then I also won the prize for the, the playwright contest. And uh, so here we go, you got two directions. And uh, the prize, when I won the science fair project, uh, science, science fair uh, prize, uh, I was, they were going to enter me in the national uh, competition, and that was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay? The play was going to be presented by Trinity University Drama uh, Department in San Antonio. The difficulty was that they were both on the same weekend, and I had to choose whether I was going to one or the other. <coughs> and the rationale went something like this. If I went to San Antonio, I would drive. I would have to drive. <clears throat> if I went to Albuquerque, I would get to fly on an airplane for the first time in my life. I went into science. 
<laughs> yeah, that's how the major decisions in our life happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it. But still, in your self-narrative, you say that um, you went from being an English major to uh, being um, to uh, into a path of basic science discovery. Yeah. So, and um, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey journey to science and um, what contributed to your decision to yeah. pursue science? Well, <coughs> as I as I mentioned, <coughs> I had sort of uh, both feet in two camps, <coughs> and my solution was to become Dr. Zhivago. And uh, you know Dr. Zhivago quite well because you're from Russia. And uh, he combined literature and science and, and medicine, and I, I thought that was a great uh, model. So I um, uh, decided to major in English and uh, take a pre-med course, which I did. And then I was admitted to medical school, and I was very happy I was going to go to medical school. And I went to see the physician that I had been seeing after I found that I had cystic fibrosis. And um, he said, uh, no, you're, uh, you're not going to be a, a doctor. You don't want to be a doctor. Uh, do you want to be like me? Uh, I'm a zookeeper. Uh, <laughs> so, so you want to be a scientist. So I want you to go over there across the street and talk to Dr. Phil Pott, who has a, a lab uh, doing cell biology and see if you can study with him. And so that's, uh, that's basically what I did. I didn't go to medical school. I went to... Uh, Rice University to get my PhD and then follow that up with a postdoc at UCLA and sort of converted from <coughs> a, a cell biologist to what I guess I would consider now kind of a halfway uh, uh, cell physiologist. And I found that um, I really loved physiology. I mean, I was in a cell biology lab for my PhD, but you know, electron microscopes are wonderful. And at that time, they were really wonderful because there weren't very many of them. But they don't move. And I took a physiology course by Dr. Ray Glantz, and that really turned me on because we had a noosing chamber that had voltmeters on it that needles went back and forth, and then we did a, an axon prep with the action potentials, and you see the oscilloscope squiggle. And that was magnificent, wonderful. And uh, about the t that time, there was a lot of things going on in cystic fibrosis, which were kind of far afield because we really didn't understand this disease at all. And uh, at that time, the, um, the prevalent idea was that there were factors circulating in the blood or in the saliva, the secretions of CF patients that caused the abnormalities in electrolyte transport. And one of the ideas was that th this was a, uh, a cationic peptide. And so I was working in the lab and decided that, uh, well, maybe I should study transport. And so it was suggested that I look at uh, a preparation which had just been developed by Jared Diamond uh, with the rabbit gallbladder and uh, use that. So that's what I did. I did my thesis on that and the interaction of cationic uh, peptides uh, on the cell membrane and the effect on transport. And so I went then from there to UCLA uh, to uh, do a postdoc with Dr. John Tormey, whose lab was right next to, to Jared Diamond's. And so that turned out to be a rather serendipitous fit. And, <coughs> and I, um, I guess our audience will be very interested to um, hear about your postdoctoral years, your training, and what you did. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I don't know if they'll be very interested, but I'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> So the, the, the first thing that I remember about this is that I went into Don, John Tormey's lab, and John was working with electron uh, microscopy and x-ray microanalysis, trying to identify the compartments of, uh, of solutes in cells, electrolytes mainly. And I didn't really know what I was going to do or what I was doing, and he didn't put me to work immediately. He let me flounder around for uh, several weeks. And then he finally walked in and said, you need to get busy, <laughs> find something. So I did, and I started, uh, I actually started working on uh, submucosal glands of the airways <coughs> because I wanted to do something that was interested, uh, that pertained to cystic fibrosis. And the airways that clearly were uh, a real target or organ. But I quickly realized that the organs that are affected in cystic fibrosis are all torn up. That is, they are pathologically really affected. And so getting that tissue and looking at it, you had no, really no place to start uh, beyond the really awful pathology. 
And so thinking about it a little bit more, I thought, well, what about the sweat glands? Because these are universally uh, affected, apparently, and yet they don't get pathologically uh, destroyed, be, presumably now, because they don't produce much mucus. And so I decided that, well, maybe we should study, I could study the sweat glands. And the problem with the sweat glands, however, is that it's very small, and uh, how do you study uh, transport in an isolated gland? even though they're morphologically intact in both CF and normal patients. So I spent a number of years uh, scavenging uh, skin from, from uh, patients and subjects and various sources. One of my principal sources was, <coughs> I can sympathize with this now, was the skin from bald spots on uh, old men <laughs> when they had hair transplants. So they'd throw these uh, bald pieces of skin away and they're full of uh, sweat glands. So. So we, yeah, so we had, uh, we had some tissue to learn how to do this. And then uh, it's ironic that today, Maurice Berg just gave a, a historical review of the history of uh, microperfusion. And I, I guess that if it weren't for, for uh, Maurice Berg and Jack Orloff and Jared Grantham and Abenau, that, um, that I wouldn't have had a career because it was the application of the renal tubule microperfusion apparatus <coughs> to isolated segments of sweat ducts that allowed us to actually look at what was going on in, uh, in uh, sweat ducts or sweat glands, comparing humans and normals. And so that took several years, it really did. I, uh, became, I finished my postdoc uh, at UCS, UCLA having developed the, the, the procedure to microperfuse, isolate and cannulate and microperfuse. But the issue was, how do you tell what you've got? And so I was going about it to try to analyze the concentration of fluids that were perfused. And so we developed techniques for analyzing uh, uh, nanoliter, picoliter samples. Uh, but that still wasn't enough. And uh, once again, Maurice Berg entered my life at a conference in, in Brussels. And I guess that was about 1981, uh, 81 or 82. And as a consequence of that, I had to try to become, learn to become a, a semi-electrophysiologist because he said that, well, what you should do is do this electrically, measure the potentials. And so that sort of sent me back to square one with the oozing chamber and the principles of electrolyte transport and that sort of thing. And so we wound up, found, finally wound up being able to put the whole system together with microperfusion, with electrodes, and I, I can still remember the day that I hooked up a, a gland from a CF patient. And uh, I, I predicted that the, uh, if the, um, I, I predicted that it should be different, but I didn't know how much different it would be. And uh, after looking at normal glands, the, the luminal potential was usually about seven to eight or nine uh, millivolts negative, lumen negative. And I put the CF gland in there and it went to 10, 20, 40, 50, 80, almost 100 millivolts negative. I Did you believe that? Believe <laughs> I was jumping up and down. <laughs> and uh, I, had, I had the previously thought that it must be uh, a problem with chloride, but I wasn't sure. And when that potential came out, that negative, I thought, my God, this, is, this has got to be it. And so, uh, you know, as I said before in one of these review, one of these things, I, I really jumped up and started yelling "Eureka!" <laughs> I bet that it was exciting. See, it was. I mean, really, uh, if you're in science and if you have a curiosity, when you answer a question, it is really one of the most rewarding experiences I think you can have as a as a living uh, being. Uh, you know, it's it's. You know, some people go into things for money and that sort of thing, but to go into science with the curiosity to answer questions, it's, it's, you know, I really, I think it's the best thing you can do. And, um, well, anyway. No, this is true. And um, I hope you don't mind if we move a little bit from the excitement of the science to uh, your career path. And uh, your CV says that um, after your postdoctoral training at UCLA, at UCLA, you went to Harvard for one year and then came back to California. If you don't mind very briefly commenting on what led to this um, interesting appointment. Okay. <laughs> well, this is, uh, my, my, my story here is a little bit out of sequence, but if you go back to that, yes. 
Um, I, had, I, I was studying microanalysis of picoliter droplets, nanoliter droplets, and uh, Claude Lachene was at Harvard, and he was kind of one of the pioneers in, in this technique. So I went to study with him as a visiting professor for, uh, I thought I was going to be there a year, but I arrived uh, before Christmas, and that was the coldest winter ever. It, I think it went for two, we went for two weeks without it getting above five degrees Fahrenheit. And <laughs> I, I, I discovered one thing there, that I was going to live in San Diego. <laughs> so so uh, that made me a confirmed, uh, a confirmed San Diego and coming back and coming back to Los Angeles. Uh, I, I shouldn't say San Diego, I should say Southern California because I wasn't in San Diego at that point. And so uh, when I came back, I then uh, worked uh, in the nephrology department uh, in physiology. I had a joint appointment and with Chuck Kleeman, who was very helpful. It allowed me to kind of do my thing and my profuse sweat glands. And then I uh, got a tenure track position at uh, uh, UC Riverside. I don't know if anyone has heard of those, those things anymore. But there, in those days, we did have tenure track positions. <laughs> And so I was very fortunate to, to get one and eventually get tenure there. And so uh, at that, it was at UC Riverside where we really kind of put the finishing touches on the microperfusion with the electrophysiology and found that the chloride uh, permeability or chloride conductance of CF tissue in the sweat gland is compromised significantly. And, uh, you know, of course, that we've now, we now know that it's compromised in all affected tissues. So, but um, after finding that, I was rather haunted by the, by the observations in the disease, cystic fibrosis, and what we were finding in our basic science. And we knew since Dorothy Anderson defined the disease in the early 1940s, that the problem was mucus, you know, and the disease is most, has been widely known as mucoviscidosis, thick, sticky mucus. So the question was, what did that have to do with chloride permeability or chloride lack of chloride conductance? Blocking of chloride conductance, why would that cause mucus to get steep? So at that point, there was basically no connection between two things. Yeah, we didn't have a connection there. And I could not get a connection. Why would, why would no uh, uh, chloride cause sticky mucus? And of course, it was some time after that that we began to develop the theory of secretion and realize that secretion depends upon chloride. And there was also, at the same time, a, uh, a prevalent theory that the mucus was thick and sticky because there was an increased absorption of sodium and chloride, and therefore water. Uh, but that didn't make much sense to me, or at least I couldn't get it together, because I knew that the absorption of sodium and chloride in the sweat duct was obliterated. It was, you know, we, we get very high salt in the sweat of CF patients because they simply can't absorb it because the chloride conductance is, is gone. So to transport that to the lungs and say that it's the opposite gave me problems. And so uh, at some point, I guess at the late, uh, late 80s, uh, early 90s, I was um, thinking about this and, and, and went back to uh, uh, Pedro Verduga's work, <coughs> who made the original postulation of how mucins are formed. And his conclusion and observation was that mucins are, are synthesized in little tiny granules in goblet cells, for example, and other cells too, but they're very compacted. So these are huge molecules. They're the longest molecules, I guess, that, that exist in biology, and they are covered with fixed negative charges. So they're extremely electronegative. And you think, oh, well, that's nice. It's great if you're in the ocean and these things are floating around. But if you're in a cell, what do you do with that? because you've got this thing, it's gonna take up the whole cell. Well, to make a short story uh, short, <laughs> Pedro said what happens is that Mother Nature puts these things together in these little granules and packs them full of calcium and low pH. So the negative charges are, are not seen, they're coalesced, and so you, just, you can compact the mucin into this little tiny thing and hold it there until you're ready for it to go. Then when it goes, <coughs> it goes out and it goes boom, you know, just in uh, uh, a matter of a second or so, it, it changes volume about, uh, about three orders of magnitude. It really kind of explodes. And so 
I think, well, what, what's going on here? How does that happen? Because you've got to get rid of those calcium binding sites. Mm -hmm. And it suddenly thought, well, maybe it's bicarbonate because calcium and, and carbonate make a rather tight bond. They have a high affinity for each other, calcium and bicarbonate also. So maybe it's that. And so we did some experiments, and, and sure enough, if you take away the bicarbonate, you get thick, sticky mucus. And so that put us in the idea that, this is, that the disease in cystic fibrosis is probably largely due to the inability of the organs to secrete bicarbonate. And of course, we knew this sort of from years ago because the pancreas is one of the first organs in CF to be uh, destroyed. And uh, what organ secretes bicarbonate better than the pancreas? So uh, that sort of really kind of congealed things for us. <coughs> and uh, so then, you know, we, uh, we've pursued that. There's still a lot of work, uh, work going on uh, with that. Uh, Gunnar Hansen from uh, Gothenburg has done some very nice studies on that as well, showing the same, same thing. Uh, and we've also tried to combine this or uh, link this to the disease in terms of the small airways. And uh, we've known for years and decades that the, the disease, uh, in cystic fibrosis, the morbidity and mortality almost always comes out of uh, uh, respiratory failure because the airways become blocked and uh, uh, unable to pass uh, air. And so we've, we've, had a, we've had an interest in, in, in the small airways for at least the last decade. And that work has, uh, has come along, I think, fairly well in that we've discovered a new function of the small airways, or at least a, a different way that the small airways seem to function with respect to uh, uh, fluid uh, transport. That is, the issue here Cut me off if I'm going, if I'm taking too much time and you've got to go on to more questions. Okay. The issue here is when, when, when we're sitting here breathing, the lungs or the airways are always faced with the problem of staying just wet enough to be able to c capture debris and move it out and just, uh, are just dry enough to do that and not get too wet so that we drown. So if we, if we have too much fluid, we drown. If we don't have enough, the airway gets dry and it accumulates dirt and we, we get sick. So how does it do that? Well, the prevailing theory was that the uh, airway kind of secreted for a while and then it absorbed for a while and it secreted a while and absorbed for a while. Uh, and that means that the, the epithelia would have to turn around and go backwards. You know? And I didn't know of any examples. I don't know of any examples of an epithelia that really does that. Maybe I shouldn't go on the record of saying this, but I didn't. <laughs> And so I thought this is a little bit strange to have a, the, the, the small airway to be unique in that regard. And so we started looking at it and we took our micro perfusion apparatus and modified it. Uh, I think Mo, Moberg would be very happy with this and modified it so that we could make a, a mini oozing chamber. And uh, basically we took a small uh, capillary about uh, a millimeter uh, and a half in, in diameter and polish the end of it so that we could press it down onto the surface of an uh, opened uh, small airway. And in small airways are about one to two millimeters in diameter. So when you open them up, you get something that's maybe three or four millimeters in, in width by, so, so it's a pretty small piece of tissue. So with this apparatus, we can just gradually, very, very gently and precisely push down on the surface of the uh, opened airway and get a, an electric seal so that we could then measure uh, equivalent short circuit currents. And with those, we discovered that, whoa, this epithelium is not going this way and that way back and forth. It's going back and forth constantly. I mean, it's, it's, it's continuously secreting and continuously uh, absorbing. So how could that be? You can't have the same cell going backward and forward at once any more than I can walk backwards and forward uh, at the same time either. And the only conclusion you can come to then, I think, is that you've got two different groups of cells, one of which is secreting and the other is absorbing. And as it turns out, we're pretty, we're, we're pretty convinced that that's what the case is. And we've just done a, a, a localization study for NKCC1, which indicates secretory cells. 
and those turn out to be in, restricted to what I call the, the pleats of the plication of the small airway. And it looks like the absorption was localized uh, by, we, we think, by ENAC uh, at the apical portions or the, uh, the folds of these plications. So we have two groups of cells that kind of do this, they secrete and absorb, secrete and absorb, and that helps, that keeps the airway from flooding because as, 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 as the fluid gets more, it absorbs, and then it keeps it from drying out because it's always secreting and that, that uh, fluid in the, in the secretory pleat can't be absorbed. So we're pretty happy about that. It, it, it feels good. So, well, I think this is a tremendous story, and uh, I especially like your story about that concept that haunted you for years. And well, you told us a little bit about your research efforts, and uh, I was wondering if you could mention uh, a couple of people that contributed to this story. Oh, this is a very difficult question because I'll leave somebody out. I mean, there are all sorts of people who really contributed. I suspect the first person to have a big influence on in my life was Dr. Gunyan Harrison, who was the physician who told me, you're not going to medical school, you're going across the street to do science. Uh, he was a wonderful uh, uh, pediatrician, wonderful guy. And, uh, and then Bill Philpott, uh, Dr. Philpott, he ran the uh, electron microscope cell biology lab at Rice University, and I took my PhD under him. Uh, John Tormey gave me the opportunity and the, the harbor to, to ex and the freedom to explore and uh, bounce silly ideas and questions off of him. He was a guiding force. And um, uh, I didn't interact with Jared Diamond very much, but I did interact with his students. So uh, those guys were very, very helpful. We were all kind of in the same milieu. Uh, and. Uh, so those are the, the principal characters that were very influential in, in my education. Chuck Kleeman uh, ran the nephrology department or division of nephrology at UCLA, it was very helpful. Um, and I think I mentioned Maurice Berg as, as kind of changing my <laughs> ideas of what I was supposed to be doing. Very, very influential. And although I didn't know him very well, but it's just a single, thing. it's one of those things again, one of the, a couple of minutes of exposure or something can change your entire life, you know? And it's really, really interesting that life is put together sometimes like that. Yeah, this is amazing. Um, I'm going to ask you a little awkward question now. Um, what is, in your opinion, your major contribution to physiology? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know. I hope that it has to do with those three things that I just kind of uh, went through. I mean, I, I think that finding that chloride, what I called chloride impermeability, or the loss of anion conductance in the sweat gland, uh, I think that changed the field. And it was, uh, I think that was an important observation that, especially since we've been able to verify that in the other affected tissues where it's been examined. Uh, so I, I, I think that was probably significant contribution. I think uh, that I would also say that finding that bicarbonate, which I as a, a so-called physiologist was trained to think of as the extracellular buffer. You know, it's the 25, 24 millimolar bicarbonate is how you keep your, your body pH on track. And that's it, you know. And, you know, the <laughs> to tell you the truth, it should be a little embarrassing for us as physiologists that we don't like bicarbonate in our solutions because <laughs> because it's so much of a hassle. You know, if you use bicarbonate, you gotta have CO2 and all this. And so we just say, nah, give me some tris or give me some heapies and let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Tissue seems to work okay. That's what we do, yeah. So, but no, finding that the bicarbonate is really uh, critical to the formation of mucins, I, I, I think that uh, that's a significant observation also, that um, you need bicarbonate for something besides a buffer. And I think we're going to find out if we continue to look at this that bicarbonate has many more roles than just keeping the pH of the extracellular fluid constant. It's involved in immunology, I'm convinced, and uh, mucin formation, lubrications, maintaining the pH of extracellular fluids. It's uh, a, a big deal. And then the last thing, and we have to wait a, a little longer, I think, to see how, how this is going to play out. But at, at least for the moment, we're very pleased with the findings in the small airways because here we had a structure that's been there for a long time and yet 
we were kind of misinterpreting its function. And I think that we've given a function to it now that will be, I, hopefully, I hope, will be uh, significant for uh, therapeutics and, and regulating the, how the airways uh, uh, lubricate and uh, manage their hygiene by being able to tweak absorptive activity versus uh, secretory activity. And um, what we really want to do now is show that there is bicarbonate secretion in, that, in, that, uh, in the airways because this is where the bicarbonate and the mucins get mixed to, uh, to, uh, to uh, maintain the hygiene that keeps lungs healthy. And so it's perturbations in that that give us a lot of trouble. Right. Well, I think this is a great discovery. And we'll see what we see right now, just the start of it. Yeah. So, And uh, to switch gears a little bit, um, let's talk about the American Physiological Society. We're here right now at the um, annual meeting of the APS, um, the Experimental Biology Meeting. So um, I was wondering, what is your favorite thing about APS meetings? Maybe uh, a story you would like to share about APS? or um, your favorite meeting or your first meeting? Oh God, I can't remember my first meeting. And I've been to so many meetings that it's, I mean, uh, it's hard to, you know, hard to say that there was one meeting that, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess I have to say that the one meeting that stood out was when I really had the, the incredible honor of, of giving the Oosing lecture. And uh, that, of course, I guess would make an impression on <laughs> Just about anybody, but I really, I really did appreciate that, and it was, it was an incredible honor to, to follow, uh, to have that lecture because I've followed so much of Oosing's work. I mean, you know, that was my the basis of my physiology was the Oosing chamber, and so that was uh, it gave me a forum to sort of present our ideas and, and what we thought how physiology contributed to cystic fibrosis and understanding it. So that was, that was probably the most the outstanding thing, the physics. But to tell you the truth, what, what does the society and what do these meetings do? They provide us a form for, um, for community. You know, we are, I'm, I'm not sure that we are, all of us are, are really normal people. You know, we're kind of, <laughs> we're physiologists. <laughs> and it's so always nice to get together with other people who are physiologists. <laughs> And we have, you know, we have, there's something, a, a common core in us. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, we're all just curious about how things work. How does it, how does it function? And so we're all running around trying to get an answer to how does it work? And uh, so it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to come to a meeting and, and meet people of the same bent and, and mind with the same kind of curiosities and be able to be honest with their questions and our embarrassments and mistakes and uh, conclusions. Uh, and so, uh, for me, that's been probably the, the, the most important thing that the Physiology Society uh, has done for me, is providing this platform of community. And I would quickly say, in, with some embarrassment also, that I think that I have gotten much more than I have given back. And because I, I really, I'm not a, po a politician or a, a big diplomat, as you can already tell. Uh, but uh, I, I do regret that I didn't take more of an active role in trying to uh, to serve the uh, society in some office or function uh, like that. So I would urge those of those young folks who are coming up to really take a, an interest into it. We've done a, we've we've really come a long way in developing the society. We have lots and lots of um, uh, aspects that have been developed over the years to help people in, in their career, young people, and I, I'm proud of that. You know, although I didn't, I can't assume any responsibility for it, but. I'm proud that we are able to try to help and influence people that are coming along. Well, and you've trained a bunch of people, and I was wondering if there is some kind of advice you would give to students starting out in physiology now? Um, well, physiology is difficult, but I would say that if you find something that's difficult to do, you know, something that not everybody wants to do, because if everybody wants to do it and it's easy, it'll be done. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think that the fact that perfusing a sweat duct was very difficult uh, probably gave me a significant advantage because, well, as my mother also said, I'm hard-headed and ornery and won't give up. <laughs> 
And so it took some time, years, and quite a bit of uh, patience to get to the point where I could actually get that pipette tip down inside the lumen of a, uh, of a, uh, a, a sweat duct. And working with uh, small airways is not easy either. Those are very friable tissues. And so, uh, you know, if, if you ask me for advice, and this is what I tell my people, you know, if, if, you, um, if you're going to do something this easy, it's probably already going to be done. So don't be afraid of it being hard. You know, just be stubborn. Yeah, and that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Well, um, in, well, you strike me as a person that uh, likes a challenge. So <laughs> <laughs> um, to finish up with, um, I would like to ask you one more question. So what do you think are the future challenges of physiology? And in general, what is the future of physiology? How do you see it? Well, do you think function is ever going to go away? <laughs> Function is always going to be here. The future of, the future of uh, physiology is unquestionable. I mean, no matter how much we get into informatics and genomics and epigenomics, <coughs> I mean, I, in my lifetime, <coughs> we've had these kind of scares, you know, that biochemistry was going to overcome us and overshadow physiology, and maybe it did for a little while, and that genetics was going to, and, and maybe it did for a little while. But physiology is, is there, you know? And I, if I can paraphrase phrase, uh, Paul Enzel, um, uh, who was an officer in the Physiology Society, uh, he once told me in the back of the bus, he said, you know, the heart of medicine is two things. It's like a heart, it's two chambers, pharmacology and physiology. And you need the physiology to understand what the function is and to be able to predict what happens whenever you do something in pharmacology to change it. And so I'd like to think that that's, that's the way I like to think of physiology. If we're, gonna, if we're gonna practice medicine, we have to understand physiology. We have to know how it functions and how it's going to function when we change something. So it's, the, the, the future's bright <laughs> for physiology. <laughs> Well, this is a very positive and nice thing to say. And at this point, I would like to thank you for um, agreeing to be interviewed. And thank you very much for this opportunity. It was tremendous. And um, I truly enjoyed this. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I enjoyed it too. You're a, uh, you're a wonderful interviewer. Thank you. You put me right at ease and let me shoot my mouth off. And, <laughs> and I thank you very much for all the work you put into this because I know you did uh, a lot of homework here. So thank you very much.